Hey guys, Jeremiah with QA Gaming here. And today, because of your votes on our website, we're going to go over how to set up and play Eclipse New Dawn for the Galaxy. Eclipse is a space themed area control 4X game. And for those of you not in the know, 4X stands for Explore, Expand, Exploit, and Exterminate. And that's exactly what you'll do in this game. The goal of the game is to build the greatest galactic civilization over the course of nine rounds. The game can be complicated at first, but actually has a very sleek user interface. So we'll go ahead and see how it's set up and how it's played. Start out by having each player select an alien race they wish to play and find the appropriate faction card matching that alien race. If it's your first game or you have newer players, the rulebook recommends using the humans found on the opposite side of the alien races as the humans have no heavy strengths or weaknesses and provide a more balanced game for newer players. Once each player has chosen a starting faction, have them find the starting sector tile for that faction. Starting sector tiles can be identified as in the center of the tile they'll show a logo matching the logo on your faction card in the bottom right hand corner of your character portrait. Here we can see the flower on the starting tile here and the flower in the bottom right hand corner of the portrait. In addition, the backs of the tiles will show another sector as opposed to the traditional back shown in the other tiles so they're easier to find in a stack. Now have each player choose a collar and take all components corresponding to that collar. The collar the players choose doesn't matter, however it's recommended that they choose a collar matching the collar of their alien species so it's easier to see where they are on the game board. Starting components should consist of 16 action discs, 33 resource cubes, 3 colony ship tiles, 3 ambassadors with a picture matching the picture shown in your portrait, 8 in interceptor ships, and it should be noted that I'm using expansion components here, but your interceptors will be your smallest ship, 4 cruisers, which will be your medium sized ship, two dreadnoughts, which will be your largest ship, four star bases, which in the base game will simply be uh, circular discs, three resource markers, one of each color, and an action card. Once you have all your components, you can go ahead and start filling out your faction card. Start by taking your action or influence discs and placing them along the bottom on the influence track, covering up all the circles shown. Once that's done, take your resource cubes and cover up every number on this numbered grid here, except for the twos on the far end, like so. Once that's done, take your three resource markers and place them where indicated on the numbered track on the right and bottom side of your faction card. You can see where to put them by the colored slash that will match the color of the resource on the track. Orange is money, pink is science, and brown is materials. Now that the faction cards are set up, have each player take their starting sector tile and take their rightmost action disc from their board and place it in the center of their tile covering up their faction logo like so. In addition, for every hollow square on their starting faction tile, not marked with a little star like you see here, have them take a cube of the appropriate color from that row and place it on that square. So for example, we have a pink planet here with a hollow square. We would take a pink cube from the middle row and place it there. Once each player has their faction card and starting sector tile set up, they should take the remaining components and place them somewhere near them they can reach during gameplay. The remaining components should be three ambassador tokens, three unused action discs, eight small interceptor ships, four medium cruiser ships, two large dreadnoughts, four star bases, three colony ships, and their action card. Depending on your race, you may have unique components. For example, the Planta should have a fourth colony ship. Players should also start with one interceptor on their starting tile. Once each player is set up, find the galactic center tile. The galactic center tile can be identified as it will have this symbol in the middle of it, say galactic center sector, be numbered 001, and be double-sided so it's easy to find. In addition, because the center of it has this discovery tile outline, find a random discovery tile and place it face down on the tile. In addition, find the galactic center defense station token, which is this guy right here, and place it on top of the tile and place it in the middle of the table. You'll now place each player's starting sector around the galactic center in a shape that will vary depending on the number of players in the game. The game board is divided into rings based around the galactic center. So there's ring 1, immediate to the galactic center, ring 2, which will be the ring that your planets are on, and ring 3 and beyond, which are called the outer rings. You would use this setup for a 2-player game, 3-player game, 4-player game, 5-player game, and 6-player game. When a player is placing their starting sector around the galactic center, they should do so in a manner so that if they were reading it from the outside, they would be able to read the logo and the number in a way that it would make sense. In other words, the shield should be pointing away from the galactic center, as shown here. So I would place this starting sector something like this. I can read it even though I'm looking at the galactic center and the shield is pointing away from the center. For the last phase of setup, take the technology board 
and place the game round marker on space one of the game round track. Then, draw a number of technologies from the technology bag that will vary depending on the number of players in the game. This can be found on page five of your rulebook. For every technology you draw, take it and place it on its appropriate spot on the game board where it's shown. So here we found the star base technology. We will place it on the star base section of the technology board. Once you've got all your starting technologies, take all of the sector one tiles and place them near the board. Take all the sector two tiles and place them near the board. And then take a number of sector three tiles that will vary again, depending on the number of players in the game. And this can again be found on page five of your rule book. For a two player game, for example, you would only need five sector three tiles. Then place the trader card and the other various components, like all the uh, ship technologies, near the board where everyone can reach them. Then give the starting player token to the youngest player and you're ready to play. Now that you're ready to play, the objective of the game is to score as many points as possible over the course of nine rounds. Points will be tallied at the end of the game from controlling sectors, winning battles, discovering technologies, certain character powers, and other minor sources of points that may come up during gameplay. You can tell when a certain action will give you points as it's denoted in the game by the shield symbol with a number in it. We'll go over scoring at the end of the gameplay section. Each round of Eclipse is divided into four phases. The action phase, the battle phase, the upkeep phase, and the cleanup phase. During the action phase, the player with the first player token will take the first action. Actions are listed here on your faction card. To take an action, simply move a disc from your influence track up to the action you wish to take. So let's say I wanted to take this action right here. Play will then continue clockwise until it comes back around to me, and I could take another action, or I could pass. If I wanted to take the same action, I would take another influence disc and simply place it on top of this disc. Gameplay continues until all players pass, but let's go over each of these actions and see what they do. A list of all available actions and what they do is listed on your action card. The first action available to you is the explore action. You'll notice this race actually has two hexagons here for their explore action, but most races only have one. And that's part of their unique power, and you can read about that in your rulebook. To take the explore action, I would do it like I would do any other action, and move my disc up to that action. When a player takes an explore action, they can do so only through an open wormhole. Open wormholes are these little half circles shown here that lead to an empty section of the game board. You can explore from an area where you either have influence, meaning this little disc, or a ship. When you pick an area you want to explore to, go ahead and draw a tile from the appropriate stack, meaning a 1 from the center area here, immediately adjacent to Galactic Center, 2 for the ring that your home worlds are on, and 3 for anything beyond. If there are no more 3s left in the stack, you cannot explore to that ring and beyond. Draw a tile from the appropriate stack and look at it. If you like what you see, you can go ahead and place it. If not, you can discard it face up and your turn will end immediately. If you do like what you see, place it where you said you were going to explore, and place it in such a manner that one of the wormholes on the tile lines up with the tile you are exploring from. So I could place this disc like this, but I could not place it like this. Once the tile is placed, if there are no ancient aliens on the tile, you can immediately take control of it by taking your rightmost influence disc from your influence track and placing it in the center like so. This is a good point to mention that any time during your turn, if you have any face-up colony ships, you can flip one face down to move a resource cube from your resource track onto a an empty planet where you control influence in that sector. So for example, we have an empty pink planet here where I can move a cube. If I flip this face down, I take a cube of the matching row and place it on that planet. Planets with a star in the square require special technologies to place cubes there, and we'll go over that later. Some sectors, when you draw them, will show either one or two ancient aliens guarding that sector. Ancient aliens can be identified by the little skull in the center of the symbol. When you place a sector like this, place a number of ancient alien ships, which look like this, in the center of that tile guarding them as illustrated. If there's two, just stack them up. In addition, some sectors may show this little half diamond shape outlining the center symbol, in which case you draw a random face down discovery token and place it there on the sector. Sometimes these discovery tokens won't be guarded, like this one right here. If in a case where you would take such a sector by either placing your influence marker there or moving a ship through, you can take this discovery token. You have the choice of either keeping the discovery token for two points at the end of the game or revealing it, well, you can go ahead and look at it and then decide, and decide if you want to keep whatever reward is shown on the other side. And these are further explained in your rulebook. For example, this one is an 11 point power source. The next action available to you is the influence action. The influence action is taken like any other action. You simply move your disc up here to take it. And when you do so, you can move two influence markers around on the game board. 
In addition, you'll notice that below this action, there are two odd shaped symbols. They're shaped like your colony ships, because when you take this action, you can flip face up up to two colony ships. And we saw that by flipping them face down, you can colonize planets and sections that you have influence. When you take an influence action, you can move up to two influence disks. You can pull these disks either from your own faction card or areas on the board where you control influence. You can then place them back on your faction card on your influence track in the right most available slot, or you can place them on the board either adjacent to an area where you have influence through a, a connected wormhole, like here for example, or in or adjacent to an area where you have a ship through a connected wormhole. So I could place it here if I wished, but not here because this is only connected through half a wormhole, not a full connection. When you pull your influence from an area where you have planets controlled, you have to take these uh, cubes and place them back on their appropriate track. So I would place this on the pink track. If you have a wild planet like this white one right here, you can place it back on any available track. The third action available to you is the research action. The research action will allow you to purchase technologies available in the technology track by spending science, your pink resource. New technologies will come out at the beginning of every round and you can purchase any technology available on your technology track. Once purchased, it will be removed from this board and placed on yours, so it's first come, first serve. The cost of a technology is written at the bottom of the technology, shown here. The first number before the slash is the base cost of that technology. When you buy technology, so let's say we buy these neutron bombs here, we look at the symbol in the bottom left hand corner of the technology. So the starburst here matches the starburst there, and that tells us which branch we should place it in on our faction sheet. We take it and we place it in the right most available slot, and reduce the number of our science points by the number required to buy it, if we can afford it. The number required is shown there on the left, too. However, the more techs you buy in a tree, the cheaper it becomes to develop technologies of that kind. So we see that we already start with a star-based technology. The next technology we buy of the brown starburst kind will cost us one less. We see the minus one there. The number on the right-hand side of the technology is the minimum number you can reduce this technology to to buy it. So this costs two no matter what. However, if we were buying something like the plasma missiles here, we could reduce it all the way down to seven if we were advanced enough in that tree. You can purchase one uh, technology with each research action. In addition to our science point savings, you'll also notice that once we start filling out these technology trees, we start earning victory points for the end of the game, depending on how much of it we're able to fill out. You cannot buy a technology if you already have it on your tree. The next available action is the upgrade action. The upgrade action will allow you to place two ship parts on any of your faction blueprints up the top of your faction card. These show exactly how your ships are built on the board, and if you upgrade any of these blueprints, it'll affect all your ships on the board or any of your ships to be built. Let's go over some of the symbols on these blueprints so you'll understand how placing upgrades works. The first symbol you'll see is the hull symbol, which is a little starburst with a circle around it. A ship's health is equal to 1 plus the number of these little starbursts on the ship. So for example, my interceptor over here has none of the starbursts, so it has a health of 1. Whereas my dreadnought has two starbursts, so it has a health of 3. The next symbol is power, which is this little lightning bolt with a number through it. This is used to power all the other upgrades on the ship. Some ships will have innate power, like this one has a 2 off the ship, and then a nuclear source here for a total of 5 power. Other resource components will require power to be used. For example, the ion cannon has a small little lightning bolt with a one off to the side, meaning this component requires one power. When placing a component, you must first make sure there is enough power on the ship to power that component. The next symbol are little starbursts with dice around them. So we have yellow, orange, and there's also red. And these are weapons. These will affect how many dice your ship will roll in combat. So we see all of our ships will roll yellow dice. Our interceptors and cruisers will roll one yellow die, whereas our Dreadnought will roll two. And the number of Starbursts in the middle shows how many damage that dice will do if it connects. So whereas the yellow die will deal one, the orange die would deal two, and on and on. The next symbols are either computers with little additive numbers shown here, or shields with negative numbers shown here. And these will either add to your roll or subtract from your opponent's roll during combat. And we'll go over how that works here in a moment. The next type of component is an engine. When a ship is chosen to move, it will use an engine for that movement, and movement over hexagons is illustrated on that engine. So if they were to use their nuclear drive, they would move one hexagon. In addition, you'll see a chevron off here to the right. The total number of chevrons shown on a ship will be determine its initiative for combat. So for example, our dreadnought here has one chevron from its nuclear drive, and would have one initiative during combat. Whereas our starbase has two innate initiative, shown over here, and would have two initiative during combat, thus allowing it to fire first. 
When placing upgrades on a ship, you can do so in any combination that you see fit. However, your Interceptor, Cruiser, and Dreadnought ships are required to have at least one engine on them, while your Starbase, which is immobile, cannot have an engine placed on it. The last symbol to be aware of when placing an upgrade is the research symbol shown in the top right hand corner of this upgrade here. This means that to place this component you must first have researched the appropriate technology. Other upgrades will lack that symbol and can be placed from the beginning of the game on. Once you take the upgrade action, you can place up to two upgrades on any of your blueprints and then you're done. The fifth action available to you is the build action. When you take the build action, you can build a number of ships and or structures equal to the number of wrenches shown on your faction card. For most races, this will be two. Once you've taken the action, you then choose a sector in which you have influence, or multiple sectors to spread them across, that you want to place the buildings or ships in. You then pay the associated cost written on your faction card. These are shown in brown circles uh, next to the structure you want to build. In addition, there's also the orbital and monolith um, structures that you can build. However, these require having access to the associated technology. In, in addition, you have to have the starbase technology to build starbases. All three of your ships are available to build from the beginning of the game. The only building limitations are that you can only build as many ships as you have components, meaning you only have eight interceptors, uh, four cruisers, two dreadnoughts, and four starbases, and each sector can only house one monolith and one orbital. When you build an orbital, then you can then immediately place a resource cube of either money or uh, science as soon as you place it. When it comes to monoliths and orbitals, these are stationary and cannot be destroyed and will be left there if the sector is either left or taken over by another player. The final action available to you is the move action. When you take the move action, you can then activate a number of ships on the game board equal to the number of arrows shown. Each of those ships then chooses one engine they have equipped to utilize for this movement action. So for example, if I am the planta and I use this move action, I can activate two of my ships. I can choose my interceptors and have them utilize their nuclear drive. If they had multiple engines, for example, let's say they also had a tachyon drive here, I would have to choose which engine to use for this activation. If I use the nuclear drive, we see that I could move one space because there's one hexagon, whereas if I use the tachyon drive, this ship could move three spaces because it has three hexagons. So let's go ahead and resolve the movement action we just took. We know that the planta can activate two ships per action. So let's go ahead and say we activate this ship and we know he can move one space with his engine. So we move him here. And again, you can only move through adjacent spaces through completed wormholes, so we can move here. And we'll go ahead and activate this ship. If we wanted to, we could activate the same ship twice in a row using up both of our activations to allow him to move two spaces by utilizing his engine twice. This brings up an important rule in Eclipse called pinning. When a ship enters a sector with an opposing ship in that sector, that ship becomes pinned. Pinning means you cannot move out of that sector. Basically, these two are in a dogfight. The number of your ships that are pinned is equal to the number of ships of the opposing player. So this, uh, this sector would have one of my ships pinned. If a second ship moved in, only one of my ships would be trapped here. Only one of my ships would be pinned. So the other player could then move out. And this would be important if, for example, I had two different types of ships in here and I really wanted to get my, uh, my cruiser out of this sector. This is a great mechanic in the game because it forces large epic battles to occur at the end of the act uh, action phase. Again, the number of ships that are pinned is equal to the number of the opposing player's ships. So if there were two ships here, then, then both of these guys would be pinned. I would need a third ship to come along to free up one of my ships to leave. If a third player were to get involved, let's say this is a third player's ship, then these would all count as pinning against me, meaning this would be a pin three situation and I would need four ships to uh, have a th uh, one of my ships leave this sector. So you can see how this can cr uh, create epic battles to occur in certain sections of the game board. One last rule about pinning. Each ship, no matter its size or upgrades, will only pin one ship from an opposing player. However, in the Galactic Center, the Galactic Center Defense Station pins infinite number of ships. And this is important because it means that ships cannot move through the center and beyond to other players' homeworlds. They have to go around the long way until the Galactic Center is destroyed. So again, every other ship pins one, Galactic Center, infinite. And uh, star bases are included in that pinning mechanism. During the action phase, in addition to one of the six actions available to you on your faction card, there are two other things you can do on your turn when applicable at any time. The first we've gone over, and that's flipping one of your world, uh, colony ships face down to place a resource cube on a planet in a sector in which you control influence. 
The second thing a player can do on their turn is they can request a trade alliance with a player with whom they had a common border. So for example, uh, yellow and blue, or sorry, yellow and green could do so here because they had a shared border with an open wormhole. Again, sectors are only considered adjacent if they have an open wormhole between them. They cannot do this, however, if one of their player's ships is in a uh, area controlled by the other player. So now they could not request an alliance. In addition, they cannot do so if uh, they have an impending conflict out in neutral space. So only if they are separated uh, their, via their ships and they have a common border. If both players agree to the alliance, they exchange ambassador tokens. And they can only accept the alliance if they have room on the left-hand side of their game board to place an ambassador token. Ambassador tokens can be placed in any space that matches the shape of their token, and they'll all be shaped like this. You can see that some spaces will have that shape, while others will have a uh, shield shape in them, and then some spaces will have both uh, together and can accept either token. We'll go over what the shields are here in a bit. So once they accept and they exchange uh, ambassadors, they can then take one cube of any type from their resource uh, section here and place it on the ambassador token to show that they are trading resources, so it counts as a wild. If the faction is ever broken later on because this counts as a wild space, you can put it back on any space of your resource track. You can only have one ambassador token from each player, and you can rearrange the ambassador tokens on your card as you see fit, but you cannot just discard the ambassador token. If a player moves their ship into a sector that has either the opposing player's influence or the opposing player's ships, they have broken the alliance. And when they do so, the ambassador tokens are exchanged back, the resource cube goes back to whatever track you wish, so we'll throw it down here just for posterity's sake. And the player who broke the alliance, meaning the attacker, gets the traitor card worth minus two points at the end of the game. There is only one traitor card in the game, so if another two players form an alliance and break it, the traitor card is taken from the player who, who uh, was the first traitor and given to the second player. So basically, if you're going to betray somebody, make sure you do it early on. One other thing you can do during the action phase that I forgot to mention is that you can exchange resources during your turn at your current exchange rate. Most races will have an exchange rate of 3 to 1, meaning you can exchange 3 of one resource for one of another. So I, could tr so I have 8 material here, I could trade in 6 of it, going down to 2, to gain 2 science. And maybe this will let me buy another technology that I really want. If during your turn there are no actions you want to take, then you can go ahead and pass. To pass, simply take your action card and flip it face down. Once you do so, if you are the first player to have passed, you can take the first player token as you'll be the first player in the subsequent round. Play will then continue around the table and every time it comes back to you, you have the choice to either pass again, letting play continue around the table, or you can take a reaction. Reactions are simply weaker versions of actions uh, available to you in your faction card that you would take in case of an emergency. Say a player attacks you after you've passed and you need to do something to mitigate that. The reactions available are upgrade, but they only allow you to place one uh, component, Build, allowing you to only build one ship or uh, structure, and Move, allowing you to only activate one ship. Because once you've passed, you cannot take the actions down here, but you can in an emergency, like I said, grab one of your action tokens and put it up here on a reaction. Once all players have passed, the action phase is over. The next phase is the combat phase, and the first thing you need to do during the combat phase is figure out the order in which combats will be resolved. Combats will occur in any sector in which there are ships uh, of opposing players, or a player has a ship in a sector controlled by another player. Combats will be resolved via sector in descending numeric order. So we have 323, 208, 226, and 1. So we would go in descending order. So 323 would be first, followed by 226, 208, and 001. This won't always be super relevant, but it can come up and be important at certain times. During a combat, if there are only two factions within a, within a hex, those two factions simply resolve combat as normal. However, if a third player is in the mix, or if there is an uh, anci ancient ship in the mix, the player who got there first does not uh, participate in the initial combat and can fight whoever is left over after the first two factions fight one another. So let's say blue is here first, then yellow came along, and then here comes green. Well, since blue got here first, Yellow and green have to fight, and whoever is remaining will fight blue with their weakened forces. So it serves well to get there first. If a player controls a hex, so let's say yellow controls this hex, they are always considered to be the defending player, and they will get to participate in combat last. Meaning, even if blue was here first, because yellow controlled this space, blue and green would have to fight, yeah, blue and green would have to fight, with the victor then facing off against yellow's faction. 
the Ancient Old Ones always enter combat last. So these two guys here would have to fight with the victor, then facing off against the Ancient Old Ones. So let's look at a very simple combat in this sector between Green's Cruiser and Interceptor and Yellow's Interceptor. The first thing to do is determine each ship's initiative to figure out which order they're going to get to fire in. To find their initiative, you just look at the chevrons on their blueprints. So we have green at the bottom and yellow here at the top. We see green's interceptor has one initiative from its nuclear drive, and its cruiser has one initiative from its nuclear drive. Whereas yellow's interceptor has one from its drive and two in eight, meaning it has an initiative of three. If there were a tie between players, and the player who was either the defender or the player who got to that sector first has the tie broken in their favor. If it's a tie between one player's ships, for example, these two have an initiative of one, then that player simply determines which ship they would like to fire first. Once an initiative has been determined, first, all ships that have missiles can make one shot with each of their missiles, and that's a technology you can, you can develop, and missiles will simply have you roll two dice, and they work the exact same as cannons. After all missiles have fired, then you go into regular combat. The ship that gets to fire first, so in this case it will be our yellow interceptor, will take a number of dice equal to the number of guns they have associated with that ship. So we have one interceptor, and each interceptor gets one yellow die. If I had two interceptors, then I would roll two dice, because I would roll all the dice for that ship, or that kind of ship. When you roll dice, sixes are automatic hits, and ones are automatic misses. Anything in between, you add any computers you have, so if I had a computer giving me plus two, and then you subtract any shields the opposing players have, so if they had a minus one. And if you get six or higher, it counts as a hit. So again, sixes are automatic hits, ones are automatic misses, anything in between is affected by shields and computers to try to get six or higher for a hit. The color of the dice will determine how much damage they do. So we see yellow does one damage, whereas if we get a orange weapon, they do two damage. Once a player has rolled their dice and gotten any amount of hits, they can then assign those hits to ships as they see fit. So if I'm the yellow player and I roll one hit, I'm probably going to want to assign it to Green's Interceptor because it has no hull and will be immediately destroyed. If instead, for some reason, I wanted to assign it to their uh, cruiser, which takes two hits to kill, and it's not actually destroyed, I can signify that damage with this little purple cube here. So I say he has one hit on now here because he takes two hits because he has a hull. Then green will get to go and we will continue back and forth and keep having ships firing in initiative order. Again, missiles only fire at the very beginning of combat. When it comes to your turn to fire with a certain ship, you can choose instead to retreat if you wish. You can only treat to a sector um, sorry, you can only retreat to a sector with which you have influence. So there's really no place for me to retreat here. But if, for example, Green had control of this inf uh, sector and for some reason they were connected, so we'll say like that, then Green could retreat. When Green retreats, he does so with a certain ship when it's his turn to fire. So let's say his cruiser gets hit and he gets scared. So when his cruiser's turn to fire, he instead decides to retreat with it. It doesn't immediately get to leave. Instead, it simply moves to the edge right here, and I can fire at it one more time when it comes back around to me. Then when it, once it gets to the cruiser's turn in initiative order again, then it can go ahead and retreat. And battle continues back and forth until one side is either destroyed or one side retreats. If you're fighting an ancient alien, the conflict works exactly as if you were fighting another player. The only difference is in the way they assign damage. They try to assign their damage in a way that would destroy one of your ships. So for example, if they roll two damage, they try to destroy a ship that has two health. They try to destroy the largest ship possible. If they roll some hits that aren't enough to destroy any of your ships, then they just assign that damage to, again, the largest ship possible. After ship combat in a sector, if the only ships remaining belong to the opposing player that does not control the sector, then that player can get one shot with all of his ships to attempt to destroy uh, the colonies the defending player has on each of the planets. To do so, uh, initiative does not matter. Simply count up all the cannons available on all the ships still in the sector and roll them all at once. Missiles do not work for this. Roll them, add your uh, computers, and then tally up the damage. For each damage dealt, you can destroy one colony. And if there were a uh, uh, orbital, it would also count as a planet. If that player manages to destroy every single colony on the, sh on the, uh, the sector, then they can go ahead and take control of that sector by placing one of their influence uh, cubes on that sector. Like so. The same applies for neutral space in which someone was successful in a combat. So let's say, you know, green successful here. They're the only ones still standing. They can take control of the sector. 
Cubes destroyed as a result of orbital bombardment do not get immediately placed back on the resource track. Instead, they go to the graveyard down here in the bottom right hand section of your game board and whatever color is appropriate for the cube that was destroyed. And there are the little X's showing the cubes down here in the bottom right. And the reason this is is so that during the upkeep step, players don't get uh, totally hosed over on their math because another player came in and attacked their sector. Once all battles in a hex have been resolved, players then get to draw reputation tiles for victory points based on the results of the battle. Players get to draw one hex, or I'm sorry, one tile for being involved in the battle at all, one for each interceptor they destroyed, one for each star base they destroyed, two for each uh, cruiser they destroy, three for each dreadnought they destroy, one for each ancient alien, and three for the galactic center. You cannot draw more than five tiles per hex. So, you go ahead and draw your tiles, your, uh, your things here, and you go ahead and look at them. So let's say we drew three here. We drew these three. A player looks at them and chooses one of them they want to keep. So we would obviously choose the four in this case because it's the most points. The player can then take that reputation shield and then place it on the left-hand side of their game board where indicated face down in a slot shaped like a shield. If they have no slots available, they can discard one of their other reputation uh, tiles to place this one face down to com be constantly improving their point value here for the end of the game. They cannot get rid of any ambassador tokens they have. And if there's no spots available, then they can't place it. Any discarded ones go back to the bag, and they can choose not to keep the one they just drew in addition. Next is the upkeep phase. The first thing you can do during the upkeep phase is any remaining colony ships that have not been used can be flipped face down, with the caveat that when you place a uh, cube via your colony ship during the upkeep phase, you cannot place them into a sector that has an opposing ship. So if someone's sitting there bombing one of your sectors, you can't just keep feeding uh, more cubes into it during this phase of the game. You can during the action phase. The next thing you have to do is pay your civilization's upkeep. To do so, you first determine how much your money income is. So here we can see our money income is four. And then you subtract that from your, uh, your current costs. And your costs are the farthest left number on your action disc track down here. So three, or negative three. So four minus three, we have a net production of one and you move your money track accordingly. If for some reason, so let's say we took a whole bunch of actions like that, you could not meet the, the, uh, the requirements, so it, it's negative, so we have, well, let's not go too crazy here. <laughs> yeah, let's do that. So four minus seven, so we have negative three, we would then pay that amount, so we'll go down to one here. If we could not pay that amount, then we would have to do what is called bankruptcy. When we do bankruptcy, we take a sector of the board we control here, and we have to give that sector up. So we would take the influence disc from it and place it back on the track and then reevaluate. So now it's four minus five, negative one, we can afford that. However, if when we do this, there were any influence cubes on planets in this sector, they then have to go immediately back to our resource track. And for example, if they were money uh, cubes, they would go back to the money track. And this can create kind of a chain reaction effect where you lose control of large uh, swaths of space because you didn't manage your money properly. So it's important to make sure you are tempering the amount of actions you take with the amount of monetary income you have. So if I see that I have a four income and I'm already down to negative five, I might want to think about passing because I'm getting down to where I'm going to start running out of money and have to give up certain sections of space. After you've generated your money and paid for everything, then you can go ahead and generate science and uh, materials. And the reason this is uh, that you generate these two resources after you go ahead and pay your deficit is so that you can't simply exchange these for uh, for extra money that you might need. Now, if you can certainly do so before you produce. So, for example, if I needed to, uh, if I needed one money here because I've got four minus five, I have a deficit of one. Then I can go ahead and use my exchange rate of three to one. So I'll go ahead and put this down to two from five for that one money I need. And then I would produce three more science, or I'm sorry, three more materials and three more science after I've already paid that off. And that's the upkeep phase. The very last phase of the round is the cleanup phase. And this is just the phase where you go ahead and kind of reset everything to get ready for the next round of play. Go ahead and flip all of your colony ships face up. If you have any cubes down here in the graveyard, they go back to their appropriate track. So now that you've already generated resources, they can go ahead and go back. Any of your discs up here that have taken action or that are on your action uh, reaction card will go back down to your bottom track. And this wouldn't this you know we might have three of these out here on uh, 
sectors of space, controlling sectors of space. So you can see as you take more actions and as you control more sectors of space, your costs go up. And so it's harder to maintain a large empire. So again, all these go back down to your track down here. And then you flip your action card back to its face up side. To complete the cleanup phase, go ahead and draw another number of technology tiles as indicated here on the bottom of the board or in your instruction booklet and add them to their appropriate, uh, appropriate place on the track and then move the round marker up one space and then proceed to the action round, or sorry, the action phase of the next round with the first player. At the end of the ninth round of the game, players tally up their scores to see who is the winner. So let's go ahead and do an example tally right now to see how it works. First, go ahead and check all your reputation tiles on the left-hand side of the game board. So we had a four, a two, and a one. So there's seven points from that. Then go ahead and check your ambassador tiles. For each ambassador you have, you get one point, as indicated by the shield on the ambassador token. So there's another point. Then go ahead and check any hexes in which you control those spaces. So we have these three hexes we control over here, and they say exactly on them how many points they're worth. So we see this hex is worth one point, this hex is worth three points, and this hex is worth one point, but we also gain an additional three points because we built a uh, monolith in it. So monoliths are worth an extra three points at the end of the game. <clears throat> Next, we go ahead and check our progress on our technology boards. On this very top technology track, we managed to get enough technologies to be worth one point, shown here. Uh, last, if we have the trader card, we get minus two points. And then in addition, we gain extra points based on our certain uh, race powers. And I think this is an extra one point per uh, hex we control at the end of the game. So we would get an, an additional three points for playing as the planta. And that's how you play Eclipse, A New Dawn for the Galaxy. I know this game can be a little bit complicated, so I appreciate you guys sticking with me. In addition, a variant that I want to recommend, included in the expansions that I didn't go over, was to have the second player to pass during the action phase choose the direction of play for the following round. And that's signified in the expansion by a little card showing either clockwise or counterclockwise on it, but I'm sure you guys can figure out a way to make that work. In addition, if you want to try the game but are a little daunted by the board game, there's an iPad app available that I highly recommend. Lastly, I want to thank everybody who voted for this video, and I want to let you know that on our website at qnagaming.com, there's another poll available that you, can, that you can vote for what video I'll do next. Your choices are I can either do a strategy series on Eclipse to let you guys know exactly how to beat your buddy. I can do a how to play series on Through the Ages, A New Dawn of Civilization, which is uh, one of the highest rated games on BoardGameGeek. Or there's a new iPad app available to uh, automate the Overlord for Descent 2nd Edition, and I can do a solo playthrough of that game as well. So go to the website, let us know what you want to see. In addition, follow us at Q&A Gaming.com, I'm sorry, at, uh, at Q&A Gaming, Gaming on Twitter, and we'll let you know exactly when a new one of our videos drop. And as always, I really want to thank you guys for watching.